I want to invite a very, very special guest that is uh, visiting us today straight from Canada, which is Ted Livingston. <laughs> Ted. <laughs> Ted uh, is the CEO of Kik and also the mind behind Kin. Uh, he is a very special and nice guy. Uh, and the reason that he's, he's special is because he's actually the first person to lead a regular company, which is a unicorn, and actually a, a crypto company, which is a unicorn. So Ted is going to talk with us uh, about Kin, what it is, and why it matters. And come on. All right, thank you. Um, so first of all, just a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm a Canadian, that's why I'm a nice guy. Uh, but I, I came here, I guess, two weeks ago. It's maybe my fifth time here in Israel. We have an office here since a year and a half ago. When I left Canada to come here, uh, it was snowing. So it's very nice to be here with the beach and the setting sun, so I'm very happy to be here. Um, so. I was asked to come down and just share a little bit of the story of Kik and Kin. Um, you know, people ask me all the time, you're like, you're so excited about blockchain, you always say it's going to change the world, like why? And so I'm like, yeah, okay, if I can come up here and, and I can explain why. So a little bit about my story uh, and our story. So I started Kik nine and a half years ago. Okay, I was working at BlackBerry back in 2007 before the iPhone came out and got to see this world of mobile devices and everybody would have a phone and they'd be connected all the time, uh, literally before anybody else in the world. I was a student and I was an intern at BlackBerry and they hired 2,000 interns every four months. So every four months, 2,000 new kids come through and they gave us all Blackberries uh, with unlimited data plans. So I got to see this world first. I spent two years there, and my boss was like, hey, you should go start a company. You really get this. You're good at mobile. And so I left BlackBerry, and I started Kik. Okay? So Kik was a, uh, is one of the most used, Kik was a messenger, is a messenger, is one of the most used messengers in the world. You know, we looked at the phone, and we said, okay, for the first time ever, there's no such thing as offline. What's going to be the killer application of that? It's going to be communication. Within communication, what's going to be the killer way to communicate? It's going to be a messenger. Okay? So we worked on that. We started a company. I was 21 years old at the time. Today I'm 31. Uh, so fast forward a little bit. And we built this messenger, and it just exploded. So we launched it in October 2010, and it went zero to one million users in 15 days. A million to two million users in seven days. It was the fastest growing thing in known human history. And actually to keep it running, we, like our, our data center, this is back in the day where you didn't have cloud, you had, you had like dedicated servers, we actually, actually had to smuggle servers into the United States from Canada in order to keep the servers running. Uh, we had to rent a jet and I like to think it was like James Bond and they pulled the servers out of the plane and ran them to the data center and plugged it in and saved kick and we kept growing. So we're the fastest growing thing. We were WhatsApp before WhatsApp. Uh, WhatsApp at the time was just a way to stare status messages. And fast forward to today, and Kik is uh, most recently valued at a billion dollars. So our most recent fundraising, we raised $50 million from Tencent, who makes WeChat uh, the fifth most, fifth most valuable company in the world. But we had some challenges along the way. Uh, right after we went viral, BlackBerry kicked us off their platform, um, took away access to their tools because of, you know, we we're the first ones to threaten their BlackBerry Messenger. And so as quickly as we grew, uh, we also disappeared because we no longer had BlackBerry. It would be like WhatsApp getting kicked off Android today. And so we sort of sat back and we said, what can we do? What can we do? Like, you know, we had to raise some money. We raised $8 million from some of the best venture capitalists in the world, but we lost 99% of our users over three weeks. You know, we went through this crazy growth and then back down. And we said a couple things. Like one is we want to focus on with Kick, not the phone number. Okay, WhatsApp, we can't compete with them now. And so they we opened the market for them and they just came through behind us. And it was very painful for me personally when they later sold for $22 billion. But we said, okay, we'll focus on the username and controlling your identity. But we also said we'd become a platform. 
So we were the first messenger in the world to launch an API in July 2011. Uh, the first ones to do web and the first ones to do bots. So we, we went through this crazy ride. We saw the future first. Uh, we sort of felt we got unfairly punished. But we got back in the game and, and we grew again. But the, the thing we always saw in the future was this problem we had which is, how are we going to make money, OK? I don't like making money, maybe. I like building cool stuff for consumers, right? That's what I like to do. And I want to be, like, I, consumers there, I'm like, what's your problem? What can we solve for you? How can we make this amazing for you? And that was where you start as a consumer company. But then somewhere along the way, you have to make this shift. It's like, no, Ted, we've given you millions of dollars. Now you need to make money. I'm like, oh. So we have to make money, and how do you make money in consumer? You only have one option as a digital service in consumer. You have to put in advertising. And what, what sucked about that? Well, one, now our goal is no longer to build amazing things for consumers, but now our goal is to build amazing things for advertisers. And what do advertisers want us to do? They want us to convince people to buy things that they wouldn't otherwise buy. And we never liked that. We didn't want to do that. And then we, we realized even more so that even if we did do this advertising thing and we you know, became this manipulative machine, that it wouldn't matter anyways because we would never be able to compete with the advertising monopolies of Google and Facebook. So what do we do? This is why we got so excited when we first learned about Bitcoin and blockchain. We realized that with Bitcoin, there was something fundamentally new that Bitcoin would enable that was never possible before. What is that thing? What did Bitcoin do that was never possible before? It's a couple things, okay. The first thing, the most important thing, is it allowed you to guarantee the scarcity of a digital asset. That's it, you know? Oh, it's digital gold, it's this, it's that. It allows you to guarantee the scarcity of a digital asset. So, before Bitcoin, we had physical assets like gold. Nobody can create more. But they're very hard to move gold around. On the other side, we have digital assets like points and dollars, very easy to move around. But whoever controls it can create more whenever they want. With Bitcoin, for the first time ever in human history, you could have both. You could have something that was digital and very easy to move around, but you could also have something that had guaranteed scarcity. Nobody could create more. Why is that important? It's important because it unlocked a new business model. Because what, is, what determines the price of something? It's supply and demand. So now with Bitcoin, you say, hey, we're going to fix supply. So once it's created, there will never be more. And so that if we grow demand, price is a function of supply, supply and demand. Supply is fixed. Demand grows. The price will grow. So if we could create our own Bitcoin and we set some itself aside for ourselves at the beginning, and then we use our consumer community not to show advertising, but instead to grow demand for this cryptocurrency, we could both build something amazing for our consumers where we didn't have to do ads and make a lot of money. You know? And this was uh, back in 2011. So I was really excited about this. I was really excited about this. I'm like, holy shit, this is our solution. This is amazing. I got to learn about this. And I read everything I could. I got all these books on currencies and the histories of currencies and mo monetary systems, everything I could read. And then I went to a conference in January 2012, six and a half years ago. And it was a Bitcoin conference. And there was only 13 people there. It was that early. It was, I was one of them. Uh, Gavin, the lead developer of Bitcoin at the time, was one of them. And then 11 other top people in Bitcoin. It was like this early. And I sat there. I was like, guys, guys, this is like amazing. We can guarantee the scarcity of a digital asset. It's a totally new business model for consumer services. It's amazing. But Nobody uses Bitcoin. We've got to fix that. And everybody sort of looked at me like, but yeah, nobody uses Bitcoin, but we've got we to focus on 
just the technology, not the go-to-market, not the product. Well, I'm like, well, we need both. We need to do the technology and the product and the go-to-market. And the problem with Bitcoin is the physical world today runs on dollars. Why would a merchant ever accept Bitcoin? Why would a consumer ever spend Bitcoin when Bitcoin could be worth half as much tomorrow or twice as much tomorrow? You know, as a merchant, I buy a coffee here and all my expenses are in dollars. You know, I pay my employees in dollars, I buy, I pay, buy my coffee beans in dollars, I pay my rent in dollars. So I don't want your Bitcoin. Because if you give me Bitcoin and it goes down by half and then I have to pay all my costs in dollars, then I go to business. And on the same side, for a consumer, a consumer is going like, hey, I should buy something with dollars. That's my daughter, by the way. So sorry. <laughs> She's excited. Is it that bad? No, she, she loves me. She's 12 weeks old. This is her first country outside Canada. As a, as a consumer, you're saying, like, why would I buy a coffee today when I could potentially buy two coffees tomorrow if I just hold on to this? And I said this to them, I'm like, the whole physical world runs on dollars. Nobody's going to use Bitcoin in the physical world as a means of payment. We need to focus on somewhere else, somewhere where dollars can't be used. We need to find a different way. And everybody goes, yeah, I don't know, technology, technology. And I said, well, I'm not, you know, the technology I think is super important, but also the go-to-market and the product. And so what we went out is we said, we want to prove that we can create a place where you could actually use a new cryptocurrency, where people would actually earn and spend in a new cryptocurrency. And so what did we say? Where could we use a cryptocurrency and actually get consumers to use it? Not in the physical world, but in the digital world. And so we launched this thing in 2014 called Kick Points. You can think of us as like Kickland is one of the biggest digital countries in the world with one of the most digital citizens in the world. We're like, hey, to do stuff in Kickland, you have to use Kick Points. And very quickly, with a small experiment and a very small team, we were able to create transaction volume three to ten times the global transaction volume of Bitcoin. And so we said, wow, this would be pretty exciting. If we just put this on the blockchain, it would be the most used cryptocurrency in the world. But then we said, wait a second, there's something else here. What if we, you know, this is a way for us to create a better experience for our consumers, no more ads. It's about getting them to use kick points to reward them for watching advertising, spend on uh, going to group chats, buying stickers, all these different things in our digital economy. But it's also for a way for us to compete with Google and Facebook, these monopolies. Like, let them do the ads and we will do crypto, we'll do something else. But we realized that at the same time, wait, if this is something that we need, this is something that probably all the other digital services out there are going to need as well. Like we're a top 100 app in the United States. Like imagine everybody else. And so that's where we created Kin. We said, wouldn't it be great if there was this cryptocurrency for consumers where they could actually get compensated for their contributions, not just in Kik, but across all these digital services, in messengers and live streaming apps and games and all these different places. And so we created Kin. We did an ICO. We raised 100 million bucks. And we went all in on crypto. So where are we today? Our goal is to be the most used cryptocurrency in the world. This is the strategy and the game plan we have literally been hoping for since 2011. That one day we could change the game for consumers, for developers, to get everybody working together to say to developers, hey, if you adopt our cryptocurrency, you'll be creating demand for it that will make it more valuable, we'll give you that piece of the value and you can come work with us. And you can own a piece of the ecosystem. And to consumers, if you contribute to our ecosystem, you'll get rewarded and compensated by digital services and other consumers and you too will own a piece of this ecosystem. And so I think at the end of the day, what gets me most excited about cryptocurrencies, for Kin, yes, it's a, it's a, I think Kin is a way to fundamentally revolutionize society. But I think if we go down a level, blockchain, why are you here? Why should you be here? Why am I so excited? Why should you be so excited? Is at the end of the day, what does blockchain let us do? It is the first time we can get millions, hundreds of millions, billions of people to work together. 
You know, if you think about how people have worked together in the past, it's been through contracts and the legal system and, hey, come work at my company and sign this contract and maybe I'll give you something. And there's a lot of friction to that. But now with the cryptocurrency, because we can create this asset of guaranteed scarcity and we can give it out through smart contracts, which we're going to learn about today, now you can say, listen, you don't need to trust us. We're trying to achieve this goal. And if you come contribute, you'll get a piece of the asset. That asset is guaranteed to never get diluted. And no matter where you are, we can guarantee that you'll get paid. You'll get your piece. And this is the thing that I, I love about Bitcoin as an example. You know, Bitcoin was the first example of this, is what did Bitcoin do? It got millions of people to work together. They said, listen, if you, we created this new asset called Bitcoin, there will never be more. People will use it to move their Bitcoin around. And, but what we need is we need you to come contribute your computing power. And if you contribute your computing power, we'll give you a piece of Bitcoin, the mining reward. And fast forward to today, and the Bitcoin computer hashing rate is 100,000 times more powerful than the top 500 supercomputers in the world. Okay? So take the top 500 supercomputers in the world, put them in a, put them in a big building like this, and then build 100,000 of those buildings, and that's the power of Bitcoin's computing power. They were able to get people to come together from all over the world to contribute that much power to build that thing based on this permissionless cryptocurrency. If you come contribute, no matter who you are, you can contribute and you can get paid. And so I think there's something fundamental happening with blockchains. I think there's something fundamental happening with cryptocurrencies as a way to get humanity to work together to solve the problems that need to be solved. And that is all enabled by the blockchain and by smart contracts. So we are super excited to be here a little bit about our company. Kick, our messenger, is headquartered in Waterloo, Canada, with an office in Toronto as well. And then Kin, our sort of second child, this cryptocurrency, is headquartered here in Tel Aviv. That's pretty fucking cool, I think. <laughs> why? Because we, we, have, we have here in Tel Aviv and we also have an office in New York. But why Tel Aviv? Because we said, listen, in Waterloo, we know how to build a messenger. We know how to take it to scale. With Kick alone, we can make Kin the most used cryptocurrency in the world by mainstream consumers. But if we're going to build Kin, we need a second site, a second headquarters to run parallel to Kick, full steam ahead. And we think Tel Aviv is the best place in the world for that. We think this community is just like so tightly connected, so hardworking, so smart, is unique in the world. Maybe that's because we're Canadians and we're a bit of underdogs in Canada. Maybe Israel is a bit of underdogs here in this part of the world. But we're, we're passionate and we want to punch above our weight. There's hunger here and expertise here. So, last thing I'll say. This is where we live on this floor here. We have the best view in Tel Aviv, as you can see. And we, of course, are hiring. So if you want to come change the world with us, if you think that it's unfair that these digital monopolies are not only crushing developers, you know, all the way up to and including Snapchat, and if you think it's unfair that consumers, the goal of every big tech monopoly is to manipulate them, to buy things that they don't want to buy, and to give them no value in return, um, we hope you'll come work with us because we're working on really amazing things and we're really excited. So with that, I will turn it over back to Natanel. Thank you for your time.